Hey, have you heard the news? The 3DO is back! No, not the short-lived and low-selling 3DO interactive multiplayer, but rather a bunch of the games released on the system between 1993 and 1996. In news I certainly didn't see coming, Ziggurat Interactive has acquired the rights to the 3DO back catalog and plans on re-releasing dozens of games over the months and years. This includes forgotten favorites like Captain Quasar, Uprising, and, of course, Killing Time. To help celebrate this exciting news, I want to take a look at that last game, which combines cheesy full-motion video and passable first-person shooting. Turn back now if you don't want to know what happens next, because today we're going to spoil the story and ending for Killing Time on the 3DO. This is Game Over the Early Years. In order to tell the story of Killing Time, we first need to introduce you to Tess Conway, a well-educated heiress and socialite who treats her imported cigarettes with more respect than her many male suitors. She asks us for help at the beginning of the game, but what's it all about? What's she not telling us? Well, let's leave that to our incredibly rushed hero to explain the backstory in the most monotone way possible. Here's that. I'm off the rocky coast of Maine, heading toward the island of Metinicus, alone. My Egyptology professor, Dr. Hargrove, was always recounting his trips to northern Africa in the 1930s and his search for a mystical water clock from the dynasty of the pharaoh Ramses. The clock supposedly had powers to grant everlasting life, claimed he found it once. But whatever Hargrove found mysteriously disappeared after a visit by the expedition's patron, Tess Conway. I've picked up the trail where Hargrove left off. It has led me to Eris Tess Conway's island estate. Tess was obsessed with the occult. Her greed drew her toward Duncan de Vries, a debonair two-bit smuggler. In its heyday, the Conway estate hosted wild, extravagant parties. It has been deserted for decades. Tess and her society friends disappeared in 1932, on the night of the summer solstice. I'm just getting my first glimpse of the house. The weather's getting worse, but I'm almost ashore. I fear my life may be in danger, but I have come prepared. Hmm, that's strange. My watch has stopped. So, our unnamed hero is a former Egyptology student who's been following the mystery of an ancient artifact known as the Water Clock of Tote. He's traveled to the Conway Estate in hopes of finding a lead to the artifact, but ends up uncovering a mansion filled with ghouls and ghosts. As we travel through the first-person mazes and shoot down enemies with the Tommy gun, we see visions of the missing party guests and learn how they fit into this supernatural tale. Now, instead of going level by level like we normally do, I'm just going to piece together the story and try to make sense of this 90-year-old mystery. Here's the one thing that we know right at the start. Tess was dating a streetwise bootlegger named Duncan DeVries, who has been smuggling alcohol for the wild parties at the Conway estate. He's also been getting his hands on a wide assortment of guns, which concerns his immature security guard, Mike Murphy. In fact, everybody from butler Robert Kenilworth to Tess's bookish friend Byron Fleming are starting to worry about the amount of mobsters hanging around the estate. But Duncan has a plan. Well, as it turns out, so does Tess. She's been using Duncan to smuggle in the ancient artifacts that we talked about earlier. The truth is, Tess is playing everybody, all in an attempt to stop the hands of time from taking her youth. You see, she seems to think that the water clock of Toad will grant her eternal life, or at least stop her from turning 30, which I gotta admit is kinda relatable. Now, it's worth noting that Butler Robert knew something was wrong. He worried that Tess's fascination with time and Asian things was unhealthy. And I gotta say, he was right to be concerned. At this point, she had started praying to Isis, the wife of Osiris, just waiting for the right time to take the plunge. Well, as it turns out, Duncan also wanted to take the plunge, but not in a crazy, turn of life kind of way. He used the party to propose marriage, which didn't exactly go as he expected. She said no. 
Actually, she kind of mocked him for even wanting to get married in the first place, which he understandably didn't take well. He ends up stabbing Tess and leaving her to die, then fleeing the scene to find that security guard, Mike. Now that last part would ultimately be his undoing, because while Duncan tried to cover his tracks, Tess managed to crawl her way to the water clock of Tote and use her blood to conjure the ultimate spell of revenge. As she lays there dying, Tess lets out one final dramatic wish. Let Duncan live, but let him be cursed with the evil of Set so he can feel the power that he craves until he is driven mad. Hey, I didn't write this thing. Now, I guess that would help to explain the ghosts and goblins and gangsters haunting the mansion and why Duncan and the security guard freak out when they see what's coming at him. All we, the nameless hero who isn't really important to the story in any significant way, has to do is race through the final maze and shoot the water clock of Tote. Whew. This is what happens next. You know, there's an early 90s campiness to this ending that I kind of love, even if it ultimately doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It pays off the full motion video and even tries to incorporate the various bad guys, which is pretty cool, honestly. If we're judging this solely based on that last cinema, I'd say the ending is definitely memorable. That said, I wish there was more to this story. Studio 3DO spent a lot of money not only creating a passable Doom clone, but filling it with real actors. Well, I mean, real people who wanted to be actors, I presume, that cast didn't exactly go on to become A-list superstars. Well, except of course for Colin Thompson, who went on to be the bald guy in one episode of Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which is probably gonna get cancelled this week. <sighs> Good on you, Colin. But as I was saying, there should have been more to this story. You get all these people involved and that through line is frustratingly straightforward. In fact, it's so straightforward that I barely had to talk about Byron Fleming and Tessa's spiteful sister Lydia never even came up. Guys, she really doesn't factor into this ending at all, which kind of feels like a big missed opportunity. Oh, and then there's this young girl who only talks in riddles. Uh, every character in this game needed to do more, and that includes Tess. The actress here is really chewing up the scenery, and I love it. She's almost a good enough reason to play through this frustratingly outdated first-person shooter. Almost. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Game Over, The Early Years. If you liked what you saw here, then you should know that we post new episodes almost every week. Now, here's the question I have for you. What classic games need to be ported to modern consoles? I guess I mean that in the sense of consoles that have largely been forgotten, like the Sega Saturn, and the Atari Lynx, and the SNK Neo Geo Pocket Color. Kind of like how the 3DO will have a bunch of remasters or re-releases or something. I, you figure it out. Anyway, let me see your picks in the comments below. So, well, I'm back. Don't worry, I'm in good health and everything is uh, mostly okay. As okay as you can be during a pandemic, I guess. Actually, I have a lot I want to talk about, but first, I need to catch up on reviews. That's the top priority. 
We're gonna be doubling and maybe even tripling up reviews on some of these days, so expect my take on Dreadnautical, 80s Overdrive, Formula Retro Racing, The Eternal Castle, Ministry of Broadcast, and so much more. If that sounds good to you, then I strongly recommend you click that subscribe button and support what we're doing here. Till then.